Well, good evening, everybody. Early, earlier we get started, the earlier we can get out of here. So uh, we'll just go ahead. I think we're one minute early. So uh, why don't you stand with us and let's sing. We are glad that you're here. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the dark Still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name, when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I My hope is filled 
nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good to see you here this evening. I trust you've had a good day, a blessed day. That the Lord has used you today to bring glory to Him and to build His kingdom. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. Had a good day today. Enjoyed having dinner with Brother Dennis and Sister Diane. Sister Debbie cooked a great meal and it was good to be able to catch, catch up with them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It was, it was good. Uh, the food was good. The fellowship was good. And it's good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. Uh, I threatened the Carriker sisters last night. I'm, I was afraid they wouldn't come back, but they've come back and they have uh, a song ready for us to sing tonight. And I believe they've shared. Marion, are you ready? They're going to sing it up. They're going to sing it a capella. <laughs> he mentioned Barney Fife last night. Barney Fife loved a cappella music. I. I, I like, Andy Griffith show is the greatest show ever made. That may be the best amen we get all night. Well, I'm going to read this scripture and we're going to pray together. Then the character sisters are going to come up and sing. And then we're going to sing a couple more songs. And then Haley and uh, Ashley have a song for us as well. Then Brother Dennis is going to come and preach. This is from Colossians chapter 3. Put on then... As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with, thanks, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this day that you've given us. It is a gift. We remember how your Son taught us not to worry about tomorrow and to trust you and to let your peace dwell in our hearts today. And we thank you that you've given us this day. We pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart and the work of our hands this day 
uh, will bear much fruit, that the words we've spoken and the work of ministry we've done today in our homes, in our places where we work, and in your church, um, will bring honor and glory to you, that the word that has been proclaimed already today would sink deeply into the people's hearts. Lord, those yesterday's funeral and today's funeral, we pray that you would give them your grace and your comfort. And the word that they heard, we pray that it would encourage them. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless Brother Dennis as he preaches your word tonight, that you would anoint him with power from on high to do the work that you've called him to do, to proclaim the gospel, to encourage your church. And so we pray that you'd bless him, bless these sisters, these ladies as they sing. I pray that the words that they sing would bring glory to you and encourage your people as well. And we pray that you do great things in this church and in our hearts tonight. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up, sisters. Uh, we have this microphone or we have several. Just with this one right here? All right. Turn it up, Brad. Oh, brother uh, Keith and Sister Debbie, that we practiced in the van on the way here, and the more we practiced, the worse it got. <laughs> All it did was make us hoarse. <laughs> she was getting on off the side of y'all. So we have to sing it a cappella because it's an, we're old and it's an old song and no one knows it. So. <laughs> I've heard people talk about heaven and describe its beauty so rare. So one day I purchased a title to imagine in that land so fair. It was given to me without money. But it cost the dear Savior his life. He died on the cross without murmur. For me, he paid the great price. Oh, I hold a clear title to a mansion that Jesus has gone to prepare. Fire cannot touch it. Floods cannot harm it, and it never will need a repair. Oh, the termites can't harm its foundation, for on the rock of ages it stands. I feel that it's almost completed and ready for me to move in. My deed was both signed and recorded, the day Jesus saved me from sin. My name was engraved in gold letters in the Lamb's Book of Life safe within. I'm an heir to a mansion in glory when from this old world here I roam. I'm waiting for Jesus to call me then I'll lay down my cross and go home. Oh, I hold a clear title to a mansion that Jesus has gone to prepare. Fire cannot touch it, floods cannot harm it, and it never will need a repair. Oh, the termites can't harm its foundation. For on the rock of ages it stands. I feel that it's almost completed and ready for me to move in. I think I recognize that one after all. Except we sang it in a station wagon, not in a not in a van. Beautiful job, thank you, sisters character. I 
I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior all that curses in body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all
It's on? Okay. Thank you, Brad.
thank you today for being here tonight. Uh, glad to see some of our friends we've known for a long time here. And then some came last night and then came back, so I told them that's their own fault. Because <laughs> they heard once and things haven't changed. But uh, Allison and Greg Dallin, are, man, they was a blessing to me for a long, long time. And it sure was not, it's nice to see them. Uh, tonight. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Habakkuk. We're going to be uh, kind of continuing on from where we started off uh, last night. I enjoyed the lunch today in Shodo. Parkers took us there, and and uh, it was and they paid for it. <laughs> I even made it. It always tastes better if somebody else pays for it. And then uh, I ate at Keith and, and Debbie's tonight, and she's a, I'd always heard that she was a fabulous cook, and it's uh, certainly... True. It's a, uh, you know, they say that uh, the difference between love and marriage is love is blind and marriage is an eye opener. <laughs> and uh, I've experienced that. Uh, married, married to Diane, I was standing in front of the mirror, bathroom mirror one evening, admiring my reflection when I posed this question to Diane Will you still love me when I'm old, fat, and balding? She said, I do. Thank you to my sisters for coming tonight and my brother David. We've only got to go to church a few times, uh, uh, and a lot, most of them here lately, but maybe when he was the Salina, we went to church together and stuff like that. So it's nice to see my brother David with us from the land of the faraway land of Texas back to Oklahoma where he belongs, and we're glad that we get to fellowship with him and see him on a regular basis. Uh, my w- first wife's... Uh, Grandfather used to pray this prayer, and uh, Brother Parker reminded me of that today. If you called on Bill Ketson to pray, he would start off this way. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And the hair just stand on my neck. Man, that guy can pray, can't he? He always started that. And that's where um, we we'll read in chapter 1 of Habakkuk and uh Verse 12, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of pure eyes and to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he. And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as creeping things that have no ruler over them. They, tuck, uh, they take up all them with the ang- angle. They catch them in their net. They gather in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net, burn incense to their drag, because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Chapter 2. I will watch, I will stand upon my watch, stand me upon the tower, and watch to see what God or he will say to me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for appointed time. At the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. He also, because the righteous, uh, by, he transgresseth by wine. He is a proud man, neither keepeth at home. One who enlargeth his desire is hell, and is as death. And it cannot be dissatisfied but gathereth him into all nations, and heapeth upon all the people. So we're going to look at this second complaint that Habakkuk has, answering the question, asking the question, God, you don't seem to be fair. We talked about last night, God, where are you when I need you? And tonight we're going to talk about, is God really fair? Father, we pray tonight that you would take your word, and you would pierce the heart of every believer. I do not know the needs of those that are here. I do not know the specific issues that they're facing. I don't know the troubles, the difficulties, the joys, the concerns that they 
the folks here have, but you do, God. As a matter of fact, we often do not know them ourselves. We just know that we're often troubled in our spirit or anxious when we should not be. So we pray that you'd pierce our hearts tonight, reveal to us the things in our life that we could change, that we could ask forgiveness for, that we could do better in, and ways that we could help others. And we'll give you the careful, be careful to give you the praise because you, to you belong all the glory, the good. It's all about you, Jesus, and we love you tonight. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Have you ever heard kids say, that's not fair? If you've been around kids very much, you hear that all the time. Maybe you've said that to yourself. God, this is not fair. It really gets to be a serious thing when we start asking, telling God that he's not being fair with us. So we pray that God would give us wisdom to understand the challenges that we face. The question, are you really fair, God, comes from an opinion or perspective, our perspective on reality. I think it's important if we, if we have to understand what perspective is. All of us have different perspectives on life. You have a perspective of God. I remember reading a, a book one time. And he showed a great big uh, uh, picture window that was all cracked, had all kinds of cracked in it. And, and it was uh, using illustration of a young lady that was molested, uh, sexually molested as a young person. And her window to the world was cracked. The, the lens she saw the world through had all these cracks in us. All of us have different perspectives on God. You have a perspective of what God is like. And it's different from what other people uh, perspective is of God. Dictionary defines perspective thusly. The act of using our senses to form an opinion about reality. The act of using our senses to form an opinion about reality. More than you realize, every day, every moment, you're using your perspective of God to interpret what's going on uh, in the world. You're using your own personal opinion about how you view things. The problem with perspective is that is not the same as reality. Your perspective not be real. You, and you know people's perspective is warped. Y'all know people like that, don't you? Don't elbow your husband. Don't elbow. Don't elbow your spouse right now. And their, their, their perspective is, reality, is not reality. There's a gap sometimes between my faulty perspective... And the, and the way things are is what causes so much pain and anxiety. And one of the reasons we come to church, one of the reasons we read the Word of God, is to get our perspective lined up with God and His Word. I can tell you uh, from, with all authority that if your perspective does not align with the Word of God, you're wrong. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't know what the Bible, I don't care what the Bible says, I believe this, as if that makes it okay. So we come to church and we ask the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and help us to get a picture of what real reality really is. Because we live in a fallen world. And the way the culture goes is not always God's way. And the way we raise our, raise our families is not always the way the world says that we should uh, raise them. So we have to get our perspective aligned with the Word of God so that the way I see it is the way God sees it. If I get my perspective lined up with God, then I'm on a good trail, and you're on a good trail too. I remember the old joke about a homeless man needing some money, and he said, I'll paint whatever you want to. And uh, she said, okay. So she gave him a, 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 a bucket of pink paint to go around and paint the porch, and he came back after about 30 minutes. It's already painted, and it's not a porch. It's a Mercedes. <laughs> Wrong perspective. Wrong perspective. And, and it's not a 1990 porch. It, it, it's a 2022 Mercedes. Uh, so that makes a little bit of difference. In June the 30th of 2002, the United States Air Force was on their way on a mission to destroy some, some muni a munitions dump in Afghanistan. While on their way, they came upon a large group of Afghans who be began waving their arms in the air and firing at them. 
They, they opened ret- uh, return f- a fire, killed 45 and wounded 117 men, women, and children who were celebrating a wedding by shooting their guns in the air. Wrong perspective. It's serious when our perspective is off, especially when it comes to God and eternity. How many people do you know that, oh, I'm just going to go and I'm as good as anybody else and I'm all these things, thinking that when they get to heaven, it's going to be okay because they thought it was that way. When, we come, when it comes to eternal things, when it comes to our spiritual well-being, it's really, 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 really important that we get God's take on it. Because it really doesn't matter what we think unless what we think measures up to the Word of God. And everybody said, Amen. So in this passage today, we're going to dig out some stuff and, and see if maybe we have some opinions about God, about how He works, that not, are not, rea- uh, not rooted in reality or truth. So God says, uh, Habakkuk, bring your questions to me. Let's deal with them. And we're looking at this passage of Scripture uh, here t- tonight. Previously, Habakkuk had registered a complaint to God about the spiritual decline of God's people. Now, God is going to give him an answer. Now, he's not giving Habakkuk the answer that he wants. He's giving uh, an answer. And he doesn't like the answer that God's going to give him. We're going to see in these verses. God says, I'm addressing the issue of Israel's sinfulness by bringing the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to correct and discipline Israel until they get things right. And Habakkuk can't understand it. He says, God, he starts coming to die. You're bringing who to discipline us? You're bringing these evil people these Chaldeans, these murderous people that worship fish and catch all this stuff, and you're bringing me. So we, we're going to, first of all, see, uh, see God is going to expose a wrong perspective in Habakkuk's life. And until you get your perspective right, you have to realize you're not thinking right. I remember one of my family members was in, had some difficulty a long time ago, and he came down and stay with me, and he said this, you know, I can't believe I thought like I thought. I can't believe I thought like I thought. How can you guys remember that you did stupid stuff and you said, I can't believe I thought like I thought? Huh? How many of y'all can say that? All of us can say that thing. You think, what in the world was wrong with me? What was I thinking? And your wife would say, you wasn't thinking. That's what the problem was, right? Always them wives are to dead gum it. And they're usually right. That's what's really bad. Bad. So God, I got to say this. He says in verse 12, he begins to rehearse to himself God's nature. God, this is not, not what you're like. Uh, did you, didn't you say that you wasn't this kind of God? Didn't you make promises, God? And he's saying, God, I've got to be honest. What you say you're like and what I'm experiencing are not the same. What you say you're like and what I'm experiencing in my life doesn't measure up. Have you ever felt that way before? <laughs> huh? Sure you have. If you haven't, you will. And it'll all come to us, every, all of us. So there's a real gap. So the first tension, he says, your actions, your nature, I can't uh, reconcile with what's going on. God, you say you're this, you say you're this, and, 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 and I just can't reconcile what's going on here. Verse 12, he says, aren't you from everlasting to everlasting God? You've been around... A long time. God, you've been around the block before. And this is the world you created, and it's supposed to work this. In other words, he's saying, God, you've got experience in these matters before. You know what's going on. You, this is not your first trip around blah, blah. This is not your first rodeo, you might say down here. So he calls them four things. Lord, the God in charge. God, all-powerful creator. Holy one, that is without moral blemish. You're pure and holy. So surely you would injure the people you love. You are my rock. Now, he's not saying you rock. Of course, God does rock. He's saying you're my rock. As a rock as unstable, as, as a stable, unmovable, reliable, unsinkable, solid. So he, he says we're not die. We will not die. He goes on and says we shall not die. And it's interesting. He throws this in his description of God's nature. And there's some comfort there. Have you ever felt like you was going to die? 
I can remember so vividly, I mentioned this other night, laying on the couch, whew, trying to take short breaths, thinking I was going to have a heart attack and die, and I was taking care of Lynn, his life was so tough. Whew, whew, just, just trying, and, and, and it, there's comfort in knowing you're not going to die in things. And sometimes, as a child of God, there's comfort in thinking you might die. Right? Yeah, I mean, you want to die sometimes. And, uh, and, and uh, I've been there, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if you have been uh, or not, because I do a lot of stupid things. I'm always getting myself in trouble. Oh, God. I'm going to die of embarrassment. Um, you know, that's what my, my kids say that all the time. When they're around me, I'm going to die of embarrassment. So, so what you're going through, you, we shall not die, especially if you're a child of the living God. So think back with me to your earliest childhood memories. My, my first memory, I don't know how old I was. We, we'd been burned out of our home, so I don't know how old I would have been. But we lived with my Aunt Zula, which is my, my daddy's uh, sister. And, and we were watching TV. And I don't know if I'd never seen TV before or what, but the Indians were chasing the cowboys. And I ran and hid behind Mama's chair thinking them Indians were going to come out of that TV and get me. <laughs> and and, and daddy was, my daddy was always such a ca- compassionate man. And he said, what's the matter with you? You're not going to die. They're not going to kill you. <laughs> that sound like daddy? You know, I did think I was going to die a few times with daddy beating on me with a belt. <laughs> So, at the basis of most of our fears is, am I going to die? If you have a terminal illness, I can, I can uh, when we bought land at Heartland, and the lady next uh, d- door to us was a funeral director for 40 years. And one day I saw a bunch of people over the house, and I thought, well, something might be wrong. I went over there, and her daughter said that she's got a terminal illness. She might live six weeks. She lived six weeks. She, a fu- she owned a funeral home. She never Made funeral plans. She didn't want to think about dying. And a lot of people don't want to think about dying. And, and they'll, they'll, we talked about a little bit about uh, the supper tonight, about having a uh, living will. So we have such encouraging... So <laughs> we, we have such encouraging uh, uh, conversations when you get old. <laughs> no, and young people think, well, I don't want to hang around them. <laughs> We were talking about having living wheels and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> we were so encouraged when we came to church tonight. <laughs> oh, boy. True story. True story. <laughs> so, <coughs> so all of our fears, most of our fears, even when we think about, as a child of God, about dying a couple uh, one year ago, almost to, to this week, almost, I lost my voice for 12 weeks. I had throat, uh, neck surgery, and uh, when they took the catheter out, I bled out like a stuck hog, and my blood pressure went down to 35 over 65, and the doctor was saying we can get a room in the uh, ICU, and, and Diane was over there crying and rubbing her hands together to see how much life insurance I had, and, and uh, not really. And I was just thinking, I don't care if I die. I don't care if I die. I mean, I really did. I thought, I don't care if I die. This neck surgery recovery is going to be painful. I, I'd soon die. You know, I don't care. Didn't think anything about my wife. Didn't think anything about my kids. I'm kind of selfish. You are too, right? So anyway, uh, I, I don't know what it has to do with anything. I don't have any idea. But I, I guess I'm going to say this. Correction. God says, I'm going to use the Chaldean army to correct Israel. It's ordained by God the trouble you're fixing to have. So here's my summation of that. God has difficult circumstances planned for every one of his children. Isn't that encouraging? Because he's not going to let you grow up to be a mamby-pamby, panty-ways Christian. If that's a word or not. You understand? God will not let you go through life without difficult times. He has planned hard times for you. So don't form a wrong view of God because you're having t- tough times. I know you can watch somebody on TV and he's smiling. Bless God, you're going to be blessed the rest of your life. And if she's just sad, you can claim it and all those different things. But folks, I haven't found that to be true in my life. Have you? It's not true. That's exactly right. It's not true. Because God loves us too much. 
He wants us to be formed to the image of God. And Jesus Christ suffered. And if we love him and we serve him and we live for him, we are going to have difficult times. So don't let the difficult things that come your way cause you to get a wrong view of God. God ordained or God planned trouble. Why? For reproof, these verses say. For correction. Because God not only wants to save us, he wants to change us. All of us need change. We have to rid ourselves of the faulty ideal that difficulties will never come to my life once I accept Christ as my Savior. That is simply not true. Salvation is just the start of our experience with God. Just the beginning. When Jesus comes into our heart, when we ask him, we ask him to come and he cleanses us from every sin. He becomes our Lord. And then he says, okay, let's get to work. We've got lots of things we need to take care of. Not for your salvation, but for your sanctification. Have you got stuff in your life that doesn't please the Lord? Am I the only one that doesn't? I'm surprised at myself. Somebody cuts me off, somebody honks at me, somebody gives me the one finger, one handed salute, and all that kind of stuff. I'm kind of, I kind of, there's things in me I didn't even know was there. How about you? If my not, wife's not with me, I'm going to chase them down, honk back at them, blow them a kiss. My favorite thing is to blow them a kiss. If it's man, especially if it's a man. They just get enraged. And Diane doesn't like that. She doesn't like for me to do that. And uh, I get around stuff like that, and I think, well, where did that come from? It was in here all this time. And that's not good. It's not good. So God begins to get us to sanctify. I have found in my life and in the life of many people that I know whom God uses, they have regular indiviz- in- intervals when God ordains seasons of difficult circumstances. And you might be in that box right now. That might be exactly where you are. I mean, there's, I mean, it just seems like it. What, what is this uh, saying? When it rains, it pours? Huh? When it, when it rains, it pours. I mean, I, it just seems like that's the way. Let me say, on the authority of God's word, you're in the right place. God cares about you. He's going he's to build character in your life. He, he loves you too much to let you go on having these false assumptions and all these things. But in the middle of that, and I'll, I'll get to that more later, I could, I could just say it this way. I am a satisfied customer of the grace of God ministered to me in the most difficult times of my life. God did not leave me. He showed up. Just like Daniel in the lion's den when he was thrown in there. Just like the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. If you are a legitimate child of God, you will be given the opportunity to get closer to God through difficulties. And yes, God brings them your way. I have to say that I ultimately believe that God is in charge of everything in my life. I don't think that God causes everything. I don't think he causes somebody to get drunk and... Uh, and run down the road and, hit, and run into your loved one or to you. I don't think God causes uh, different, a man to get a gun and shoot something. I don't believe that. I don't think God causes that. But I do believe if God wanted to, he could not, it would not happen. And that might seem cruel to you. But the God I serve wants what's best for me. He wants what's best for me. So I am a satisfied go, a, a, a customer of the grace of God. God's love does not raise us. A bunch of sissies. Is that appropriate to say nowadays? I don't know if it is or not. Sorry, Pastor, if it isn't. He doesn't plan on bringing up soft-skinned, spoiled children who need everything in their life to be perfect and enjoy God and people and things. It's the truth, folks. And I will guarantee you in life, the people of this church, even younger and all the way up, there's going to be things in your life and you're going to have to show that you do love Jesus. And you're going to have to show that you, that you believe God. And you're going to have to trust Him when it doesn't make a lick of sense. You're going to say, I'm going to go with God and I'm going to stay with Him. No matter what happens, I'm staying with God. Amen. He'll do that. Because He wants you to know, not that He'll know your faith is real, so that you will know that you can trust Him in the most difficult times of life. The Lord cricks His people, verse uh, the Lord corrects the people he loves and disciplines those he calls his own. Hebrews 12, 6. 
For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. No hardship? Ooh, bad. Bad. Are you sure you're saved? No hardship? Hmm. Even bigger in Habakkuk's mind, he says, Thou art of pure eyes, and behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest upon them that deal treacherously, hold their tongue when the wicked devout the man that is more righteous uh, that, uh, than he. He is saying, God, I can't reconcile what you're doing with how much I'm, it's hurting me. Or your actions, God, versus the pain that I'm, I'm having. Have you ever noticed that when you go through great difficulties and pain, the hardest thing to stomach is people. <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you what, Christians can mean, man, they can be mean. I'm talking, I mean, they can be mean. <laughs> Phew. I mean, some of the meanest folks I know are Christians. <laughs> uh, David Archer would say, Les, I don't think I had this at Hillsdale News. They're meaner than Tommy Rod. I don't know what that means, but I, know, I do know what it means. Um, most of the time, it's not the, pe- it's not the thing that you're going through, it's the people. Like you're at work and you're having a hard time and so-and-so lies and cheats and steals and sloughs off and he's Mr. and Mr. Wonderful. And uh, they badmouth and backstab and you get called in the office. And you try to honor the Lord and do what's right and you get called in the corporate. You work hard and they loaf and, and, you, and they expect you to pick up all the slack and they prosper and, and, they, and you're struggling. Welcome to back this world. That's right where he's at. He said, you're a pure heart than to behold evil. How in the world can you let these putrid pe- people be the solution to our problems, God? How in the world can you use these wicked Chaldeans, these Babylonians, to come out here and discipline Israel? They're way worse than we are. Maybe sometimes you think, uh, I need to grow and I need to change, but why in the world do you have to use that person? If, uh, and that's always the tension. Why, God, are you using that person? You ever wonder why God used some preachers? They don't know how to tell the truth, don't seem like. You see, there's truth in it, Brother Keith. I mean, it seems like they just, they just soon lies, tell the truth, and they have people saved all the time, and the church grows, and think, how is that possible? You know? You, you guys know what I'm talking about? I know you do. I, I, it's, it's the truth. It, the pen, how can that person be a tool that God's using to work on me? I heard it said this way. If spirituality were a planet and being closer to the sun meant being closer to you, they should be Pluto. I mean, that's not even a planet anymore in case you didn't know. I mean, I might not be Mercury and I might not be Venus, but man, you're using Pluto to change me? And that's the way we look at it, isn't it? That's the way we look at it. Well, that person is so far out there, I can't believe you're using them to teach me. Well, they might even be in your house. I know I need to grow, God, but man, that pastor over there is way worse than I am. Dreamed I went to heaven, I had an ugly woman with an award on her nose. And I said, Lord, why am I married to such an ugly woman? And the Lord said, you're paying for your sins. Look over at Doug. Doug got a beautiful woman. How come Doug has a, a pretty woman than I do? I know he's sinned more than I have. And the Lord says, she's paying for her sins. <laughs> God, I, I can't reconcile who you're using with how much this hurts. The fact that you're chastening me and the people you're using, I I can't reconcile that. And then the third thing, and I'll quickly get get through this, I can't reconcile your action with their arrogance. Look at these these people, verse 14, and make us men as fishes of the sea, as creeping things. They have no ruler over them. They take up with their angle, they catch in their net, and they gather in their drag, and they rejoice or glad. They rejoice in their net. They burn incense to their drag. Because of them, their portion is fat, their meat plenteous. Shall not 
therefore empty their nests and not spare, continue to slay the nations. He's saying, I feel like, uh, just like a fish in the sea. I don't feel special. I don't feel loved. You're bringing in this heathen people, and they're treating me like a fisherman would be a fish. They're just eating us up. I thought you cared about the individual. I can't reconcile what's going on. These people are so stinking arrogant. And you're using them? Boy, honey. I was talking to, I think it was Doug this morning, Brother Parker. He said, man, last night when he was reading that Bible, it's about like reading the newspaper. Isn't it? It is. It's almost like reading the newspaper. When you have a wrong perspective on God, you better do something with it. So Habakkuk tells God how he sees it. And then God starts answering him back. In chapter 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables, that he that may run, that readeth it. For the vision is yet for a appointed time. At the end it shall speak and not lie. It'll, it, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Yet also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keeps at home, who largeth his desires hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gather all unto him all nations, and heapeth upon him all people. Proverbs eighteen seventeen says it this way. It says that the one who states his case seems right, and until the other comes and examines him. Have you ever experienced that? You hear somebody tell their story? I've heard pastors, and I don't know Brother Keith, I know you have, I'm sure Jeff you have too. They come and tell you uh, how they were treated and how wrong they were treated and all this, and then, you, and then you talk to a member and you think, good Lord, why did they put up with that that long? Right? Huh? And you think, we have a tendency, all of us, to think that we're right, don't we? We have a tendency to think that the way we look at it is right until somebody comes along and explains it. It's fixing to hap- happen here. God is taking the microphone and God answers. The Lord answered me, Habakkuk said. I had these questions. I couldn't figure it out and God answered me. I was struggling. I was burdened. I couldn't reconcile what I was experiencing with who God says he was. And he answered me. He, he talked to me. Now, if he talked to me out loud, I'd fall over dead of a heart attack. And I, I know people that said God talked to him. I'm thinking, first thing, I said, well, did you write down what he said so he'd get it exactly right? One time when I was passing Spencer and we didn't to have nobody, and the guy started coming, and he tithes. It was a big deal. He was weird as days long. And one day he stood, one day he told me that the Lord spoke to him. He's driving down, and the Lord started talking to him. He said he's going to get him a brand-new Cadillac. Out loud he said that. The God told him it out loud. And then he about a month later he bought a new Chrysler New Yorker. And I said, I thought you said God told you you was going to get a new Cadillac. And he said, well, what I meant was, I said, that's not what you said. You said God told you. And I told him I was dumb. He got up and said something else one time in church. So after church is over, I said, listen, I know you want to start a Sunday school class, but you're never going to teach here. He said, why is that? Because I said, you said God told you out loud she was going to get a brand new Cadillac, and then you went by the Crichton from New Yorker. And he said, well, what I meant was, I said, that's not what you said. You said in front of people that God talked out loud to you. But folks, if somebody tells me God told them something out loud, I'm going to go. <laughs> now, God can impress you to do things. He can impress you. His word can speak to you. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. He can speak to you through your spouse. I firmly believe that. But the devil can too. Said, no, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Shouldn't have threw that in there, should I? <laughs> I should have left that part out. <laughs> Write it down. Make it plain. And I, and I wrote this down because I won't forget it. Nothing frustrates me more and impresses me less than people that teach God's word and make it more complicated and still more simple. I, I love Stan Tolley. He was a church, he was a Nazarene preacher. And he got an English teacher to listen to every sermon he had and, and to tell him 
if he made any, used any words that were complicated. Folks, I'm not talking about dumbing it down. I'm talking about making it simple. I, I, I can remember some guys taught me going to one of those theological symposiums. I went there, and afterwards, these two guys, wait, can you imagine? And I said, that's the biggest bunch of hogwash I've ever seen in my life. They didn't answer any question. All they did was raise a bunch of questions don't mount to hill of beans. I, I just, I was flabbergasted that they would think, and, and, and folks, there's a place for that. And I, 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 it's just not my cup of tea. I guess that's what it is. Make it, God's word needs to be plain so that everybody can understand the word of God. And I'm thankful for scholars. And I'm thankful for our educators. I'm very grateful for them. But the ones that I attack to are the ones that uncomplicate it, break it down in a simple term. Make it permanent, write it in strong, subscribe it in a rock. Why? Because he runs and he's reading it. What do you do when God speaks to you? Tell everybody. Telephone, telegraph, tell a preacher. That was supposed to be funny. Put it on Twitter. Tell it. Go tell it on the mountain was an African-American spiritual song compiled by John Wesley Work Jr. in 1865. Recorded, sung and recorded mainly uh, by gospel singers. It is considered a Christmas carol because its lyrics celebrate the nativity of Jesus. But it says, Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere go, tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That's what he's saying. Tell them. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about Jesus. This morning, or this afternoon, we was in the, uh, Walmart. I don't even know why we was there for. I don't know why we was there in Walmart for some reason. I don't know. Maybe because my car drove by, pulled in. You know, my wife's car, he probably pulled in. Pulled in. I don't know. Word is simply this today. The message is simply this. Man, the Lord loves you. Uh, he loves you so much that he gave his son. And Jesus loves you so much that he died on the cross. And he loves you so much that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding. For you. So when you don't have, if you have stuff you don't understand, just talk to God about it. Talk to God about it. Uh, I think uh, Les and Marion have an invitation for us, and I, I pray that God will speak to your heart, and if you feel the need to come and pray that you'll do that. God bless you. Father, we love you. We thank you for this wonderful church and these good people and their pastor. So many people that have known for so long, and they've been so faithful, and their families are... Families from this church are just going out all over the world, really. And we're so grateful for their steadfastness, for their parents and their parents' parents, and even those parents' parents have been faithful to your cause. Speak to us tonight, Lord. Help us to be honest, and we need to come and pray. Help us to do it. Go ahead, bless.
With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Sister Mary is going to play softly. We give this message time to settle in and sink into your hearts. Maybe there are things in your life that you don't understand. You don't understand why God would allow these things. You don't understand why He let this or that happen to you. Maybe you've been disappointed. Maybe you've been angry with God. You have all kinds of questions. The Bible invites us to ask God questions. I want you to remember that God's only begotten Son from the cross asked God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Word of God says that we walk by faith, not by sight. That we walk by faith and not by explanations. As Brother Dennis said, God loves you. And you can know this for certain because God sent His only Son. I can't imagine giving one of my children. God sent His only Son to suffer and die in our place to take our punishment upon Him that we might be forgiven forever and be His children. The Lord loves you. Trust Him if you have questions. Come to Him sincerely. Keep taking your questions and even your complaints to God. Don't stop talking to God. He loves you beyond what you could possibly imagine. Marion is going to play softly for just a moment. Maybe you have a question or a complaint that you want to speak to God about. Go ahead and do that. In the stillness of this moment, pour it out to the Lord. Lord, your word tells us that in this world we're going to have trouble and tribulation, and tests and difficulties. Your word tells us that sometimes we're going to walk in the valley of the shadow of death. It seems like darkness surrounds us. Remind us that you're always with us and therefore we don't have to be afraid. I pray that everyone here tonight would experience the depth of your love for them to walk with you and to know that you are trustworthy and you're going to keep all of your promises. Help us to hold on day by day as you hold on to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come back tomorrow night at 7 for our last night of revival. We love you. Good job, Brother Dennis. You are dismissed.